Okay. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Vic Liftak, our Vice President of Academic Affairs, to kindly introduce tonight's lecturers. Vic. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Vic Liftak, Vice President for Academic Affairs, as Karen just said. And I welcome you all to the last lecture of the BAC's fall series. Practice is one of those words like studio or design that have so many different meanings intertwined by context and also quite distinct. Teddy Cruz and Anna Foreman's practice is grounded in theory and community, is nurtured in the academy and the community and actively enlists local communities as an urgent and proximal place to address global injustice. Their teaching, research and community practice has a compellingly strong, clear message. Some of the major wicked problems facing humanity are all wrapped into the politics of the built environment and how we design it, including nativism and racism, social injustice, climate change, intensive urban growth, rapid concentration of human habitation into the systems we call cities. I've been reviewing some of Fauna and Teddy's written and spoken presentations and I'm drawn to three themes or processes or human artifacts, all systems, that we probably all agree are essential to critical inquiry and action in designing the built environment. Urbanization, infrastructure, and culture. These are broad themes and systems and impact requires focus. So I'm really amazed and inspired by the descriptors they use to focus this tripartite investigation. They practice within informal urbanization, civic infrastructure and public culture, intersecting the community and the academy across that practice. So a quick bit of background info about Fauna Foreman and Teddy Cruz. It's really quick. <laughs> They're both faculty at the University of California, San Diego. Fauna is Associate Professor of Political Science and Founding Director of the University's Center on Global Justice. She's also an internationally recognized Adam Smith Scholar. Teddy is Professor of Public Culture and Urbanism in the Visual Arts Department and Director of Urban Research in the Center on Global Justice. Their degrees, awards, honors, and publications are many, and I encourage you to be inspired by looking them up and following the bios and CV clues to understand their deep and broad impact. I'm honored to have known Teddy since 1994 when he first offered SciArc summer program, LALA, -LA, Los Angeles, Latin America, and to have worked with him at Woodbury University in the School of Architecture, and to see work he started so long ago grow in significance and in real world consequence. Anna and Teddy are research partners at the university and partners and principals in Estudio Teddy Cruz plus Fana Foreman, um, a research-based political and architectural practice based in San Diego. They practice engaged architecture and social science, engaged with the people of the communities they work with and engaging the university with the community and the community with the university. They practice what they profess and they profess what they practice. Please welcome Fauna Foreman and Teddy Cruz to the BAC as they ask us to consider unwalling citizenship. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Vic, for that really wonderful, generous, insightful introduction. Thank you really so much. Um, we, need, we need that text. You have to send yeah, it to us. Send it to us. <laughs> um, we're very excited to be with you. Um, today to discuss our research-based practice at the San Diego-Tijuana border. Um, we, Teddy and I will sort of tag team uh, as we move through our, our talk today. We really see this zone where we work as a microcosm of all the injustices and indignities experienced by vulnerable people across the, across the world. Political violence, climate disruption, accelerating migration, rising nationalism, border building everywhere, deepening inequality and the steady decay of public thinking. We live and work a few miles away from the child detention centers that will forever stain this period of American history. 
San Diego Tijuana has become a lightning rod for American nativism. And although the news cameras come and go, tens of thousands of Central American and now Haitian migrants wait at the wall for asylum that never comes. Reviled by the Mexican public as a nuisance, as an infestation, it's terrible, or else they sit in US detention centers as tools of deterrence until recently separated forcibly from their children and now exposed to a raging pandemic. It's been particularly devastating in recent years to witness the emotional impact on children. You know, the fear and the internal um, psychic kind of internalization of being socially and morally marginalized. Hopefully there's relief on the horizon. I mean, it remains to be seen. But the prospect of more border porosity in the next period is drawing even more people north with misinformation circulating on social media every day, conditions here are intensifying. And climate change will make things worse. A recent United Nations survey found that 72% of arriving migrants at our southern border are agricultural workers, and that agricultural instability was a major factor in their decision to walk north. So, Global injustice is an intensely local experience uh, here for us in this part of the world. Now, against these local atrocities, border communities and activists on both sides of the wall are finding ways to confront unjust power. Some of this takes the shape of bottom-up civic agency that challenges hateful political narratives and transgresses boundaries. Much of it arises informally through everyday collective practices of survival in conditions of danger and scarcity. Over the years, Teddy and I have accompanied some of this bottom-up activity, this sort of emancipatory democratic agency from uh, the bottom up with, you know, with agencies at the front lines of this conflict. With them, we're advocating for a long view of resistance and strategic thinking about cultural, institutional, and spatial transformation in the border region. These commitments have culminated in a project that we'd like to share with you today, the UCSD Community Stations. Essentially a network of public spaces located in vulnerable neighborhoods across the border region where university and communities meet to share knowledges and resources, and to collaborate on church dialogue, cultural and educational activity, and urban design build projects in the city. The community stations are really the field-based social engagement arm of our research-based practice, our design lab inside the university. So here we are, a team, our students, some of our community partners in Tijuana just before COVID-19 hit. We have several core commitments that comprise a community stations model, which we think are highly replicable you know, for universities everywhere. So we're going to introduce these to you. I'll, I'll begin. Teddy will then take you on a tour of the four UCSD community station sites. And then I'll come back with a few words about our programming and how they link our local border context here with sites of conflict uh, across the world. So to begin, we localize the global. We've always resisted the idea that global justice is something that happens out there far away somewhere. Living and working where we do, we don't need to send our students far away to learn about territorial conflict, migration, poverty, climate justice, we're minutes away from an international border in crisis. And this enables an amazing proximity between campus and field, between theory and practice, what we like to think of as a critical proximity. Of course, going local here means recognizing ourselves as a region, a site of interdependence. Despite the wall and the ugly political rhetoric that's designed to divide us, we are a binational ecology of flows and circulation. And our future here is intertwined. Air, water, waste, health, culture, money, hope, love, justice. These things don't stop at walls. We build trust bridges, long-term partnerships between our university and border communities. We're not like sort of flaky university programs that come and go, diagnosing problems, extracting data, and then disappearing. We don't disappear. 
we're there for the long haul. We're decolonizing knowledge. We're attuned to the kind of power dynamics when universities arrive in communities and we're critical of both extractive research as well as humanitarian problem solving miss missions. We don't do applied research and we don't do charity. We're not a service learning program. Academic culture is filled with vertical assumptions, vertical assumptions, right? That we know more, that we are trained to solve the world's problems if only they would listen to us. We're committed instead to horizontal practices of co-production, engaging communities as partners with knowledge and agency. Everyone contributes, everyone learns, and we do things and build things together in the border region that no one could do alone. Universities too often take for granted the resources that communities invest when they work with us, time, space, social capital, labor, knowledge, as a matter of epistemic justice and labor equity, these contributions need to be validated and they need to be compensated. So we're curating two-way flows inside out and outside in. We're unsiloing our campus and we're inviting activists and community leaders to come to campus and teach with us. Now, today's challenges demand intersectionality. We hear this the buzzword of our time, right? But everything that we do on migration, climate change, environment, urbanization, all of these things are refracted through the lens of social transformation. Ultimately, you know, in this region, we're committed to building what we call a cross-border citizenship culture. It's a beautiful concept. A sense of belonging that is defined not by the nation state or the documents you carry in your pocket, but by the shared interests and aspirations among people who inhabit a violently disrupted civic space, which is what we are. Those who benefit from narratives of separation and mistrust prefer that we remain fragmented here, that the idea of citizenship divides us rather than unites us. But we're seeking through our work to inspire more inclusive imaginaries of coexistence and citizenship in this contested uh, you know, cross-border territory. The stations are really a model of urban co-development between the public university, us, and the community organization to fight the creeping gentrification of border neighborhoods. Each station that you'll see, Teddy will show you, is designed, funded, built, and programmed collaboratively between the university community. What they represent really is that we are rejecting conventional strategies of urban beautification that turn our public spaces into sites of consumption. We really question the agendas of the creative class and the pop-up culture, which too often gentrifies, appropriates arts and culture for private ends and becomes an apology really for the absence of more substantial public investment in the city. We believe, and our community stations embody this, we believe public space must become civicized, right? A site of dialogue and contestation and infused with resources and tools that increase public knowledge and community capacity for political and environmental action. So uh, for us, urban justice is a distributive concept requiring not only the redistribution of resources, but also the redistribution of knowledges we design the community stations as a reciprocal knowledge infrastructure, as both a collaborative educational platform, but also a model of shared urban intervention. We claimed that the economic and programmatic power of our public university can be in fact leveraged for communities to develop their own public spaces and social housing. As a distributed system of public spaces transgressing the wall, the community stations specialize social justice, mobilizing cross-border citizenship through cultural action. With our community partners, we have co-developed four community stations, two in San Diego and two in Tijuana. We will take you from north to south. The UCSD Earth Lab community station is a partnership with Groundwork San Diego, an environmental justice nonprofit located in the low income, primarily black and Latinx neighborhood of Encanto, a community characterized by high unemployment, low educational attainment, food insecurity and cyclical poverty. 
the station occupies a four acre vacant parcel owned by the San Diego Unified School District who granted the parcel to our partnership to increase educational capacity for the eight public schools within walking distance of the site. The goal was to promote circulations between traditional classroom-based learning and outdoor experiential learning. This access to municipal land gave us leverage to assemble a unique cross-sector collaboration between a major research university, a local school district, and a grassroots organization to co-develop public space, placing education at the center of community development. Before COVID-19 hit, 3,000 kids and their families circulated through the Earth Lab each year, and during the current transition, it continues to operate as an outdoor, socially distanced classroom. Recently, the school district committed capital monies towards a more refined physical resolution of the site for what has been so far a largely informal effort, while UCSD, our university, will invest in sustainable educational programming, research, and management in collaboration with Grand Works San Diego, who will steward community participation. Pedagogic zones at the site will be focused on habitat restoration through energy, water, food, and community programs, all wrapped by indigenous Kumeyaay knowledges and environmental practices. Ultimately, the UCSD Earth Lab Community Station will perform as an open air climate action park designed for environmental education and climate justice. The district has also committed school bond funding for a new climate action design building to anchor the site and as a pilot for post-COVID porosity in classroom design. This station will break ground in 2022. Moving south uh, to the uh, UCSD Casa Community Station. This is a partnership with the nonprofit Casa Familiar, a 30 year old community based social service organization. It is, it is located in the border neighborhood of San Isidro, site of the busiest land crossing in the Western Hemisphere. The community is 90% Latinx and has one of the highest unemployment rates, lowest median household income, and worst air quality in the San Diego County. The heart of this community station is a beloved historic church that sat for decades in this repair and which we are able to rescue through this project with our partners. During construction, the building had to be lifted up to install the foundations. During uh, times of so much political violence inflicted on this border community, the surreal image of the church levitating with Tijuana's informal settlements in the background inspired a sense of hope for the local residents. With the adaptive reuse of this uh, historic building as catalyst, we designed the UCSD Casa Community Station as a double project. A parcel size social infrastructure made of spaces for cultural and economic activity is flanked by affordable housing. The organizational design of the parcel through a system of linear strips with a variety of small scale buildings performing different roles was also a deliberate strategy to mobilize diverse financial streams to fund the different building typologies. Leveraging programmatic investments by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation uh, to support the educational, cultural, and research programming between the university and the community, Casa Familiar and UCSD secured capital investments by the Park Foundation and Art Place America to build the social service infrastructure. These investments, in turn, enable Casa Familiar to qualify for a $9 million uh, development package facilitated by subsidies from the local municipality. So effectively, Casa Familiar has become an alternative developer of affordable housing for its own community of San Isidro, and public space was the detonator. We renovated the historic church into a community theater with an outdoor stage, and this performance space is flanked on one side by a series of small accessory buildings for Casa Familiar social programming, and on the other side by an open air civic classroom pavilion. This uh, social, educational, and cultural infrastructure anchors 10 units of social housing at both ends of the parcel, all mediated by pedestrian walkways. We completed construction of this station in February, just before COVID-19 hit, and the residents moved in. It has remained locked down uh, uh, for now, but we are returning in person with cultural programming very soon in the next weeks. 
Affordable housing, this is what we want to say here, takes on a different meaning when it is deliberately threaded into spaces for social programming, summoning residents to participate in the development of local economy and cultural productivity. In other words, synergizing spaces, programs, resources, and people. This is an integrated social spatial system that is programmed between university and community. So let's imagine a small coalition of local artists, promotoras, neighborhood youth, collaborating with university curator, curators, script uh, theater writers, and visual artists who come together periodically to co-produce a play that explores an urgent issue facing the community enacted by local youth in the community theater. These artistic productions are rooted in neighborhood stories and become bottom-up evidence uh, to increase public knowledge and uh, also policy transformation. Before moving across the border, allow me to pause for a moment to summarize a couple of concepts and share how these processes behind our two San Diego-based community stations uh, exemplify several core commitments or building blocks, as we call them in our practice. First, in conditions of poverty, housing needs to be embedded in an infrastructure of social, economic, and cultural support. In other words, we must rethink affordable housing from autonomous units into relational systems. Housing must be public infrastructure. Second, density should not be measured as an amount, as an abstract amount of, uh, 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 of objects or people per area. Density must be understood instead as the intensity of social and economic exchanges per area. Migrant neighborhoods have taught us that these exchanges mobilized by bottom-up urbanization is the DNA for democratizing the city into more inclusive and plural environments. Zoning must stop being punitive, preventing socialization. Instead, zoning should be conceptualized as a generative tool that anticipates, stimulates, and organizes social and economic activity in neighborhoods. The developer's pro forma, as we all know, is architecture's financial plastic. Inside the mathematics of this spreadsheet, our services as architects amounts to 15% of a project's construction costs. This undercapitalized asset can be mobilized as collateral for development. Nothing should prevent us as architects from becoming developers of our own projects. And by association, nothing should prevent communities from doing the same. In other words, the sweat equity of architects, cultural producers, and community leaders, the economic equity of public universities, and municipal protocols for accessing public parcels can all be bundled, aggregated, to enable communities to develop their own neighborhoods. This truly has been our stories in the last years. So moving across the border, our two community stations in Tijuana are located in the Laureles Canyon, an informal settlement adjacent to the border wall. I will take a few moments to describe this incredible context. This uh, location is an important juncture of conflict. Here, the topography of Tijuana's canyons clash with the border wall before spilling northbound into an environmentally protected estuary in San Diego, which is now layered with militarization. At this hotspot, the conflict between natural and jurisdictional systems is profound. As we zoom in further, we witness a collision between the estuary and the US, the border wall and the informality of the Laureles Canyon in Tijuana, which is home to 92,000 people. This aerial video shows Laureles Canyon and the precarious condition of the informal settlement that has sprawled on the slopes. This site sits literally 30 minutes from our campus and demonstrates the dramatic, dramatic proximity of wealth and extreme poverty in our region. Laureles Canyon is impacted by dump sites, drastic erosion, flooding and landslides, and all of this is exacerbated by the dramatic uh, precipitation fluctuations of climate change. Because Laureles Canyon lacks water and waste management infrastructure to mitigate these impacts. So you can imagine most of the trash along with tons of sediment flows downstream, ending in the estuary in San Diego, contaminating this bioregional 
and ultimately shared environmental binational asset. Here, the border wall is an artifact of environmental insecurity. These impacts have intensified in recent years because of a profound lack of collaboration between San Diego and Tijuana to manage uh, these cross-border flows. In the last decades, 70% of the open lands in Laureles Canyon have been lost to irregular urban growth. We have been identifying and bundling on squatted lands in the settlement that are still environmentally rescuable to shape an archipelago of conservation. We are advancing an ambitious regional project called the Cross-Border Commons, an environmental conservation initiative that links the estuary in the US with the informal settlement in Mexico, forming a continuous social and ecological envelope that transgresses the wall and protects the environmental systems shared between these two border cities. Another important contextual note before I introduce you to the Tijuana stations is that Laureles Canyon has also been the site where we have advanced our research on informal urbanization. As we have written about many years, the informal settlements of Tijuana are built with the waste of San Diego, recycling architectural parts to construct habitation and informal infrastructure. We have learned really a great deal from these incremental building practices as people construct their own shelter in layers over time. In a case study we documented a year ago, a metal frame appeared from one day to another. In a couple of months, recycled materials began to thread spaces and in the next weeks, an informal house emerged. We have also taken note that multinational maquiladoras surrounding these informal settlements typically benefit from easy access to cheap labor. Over the years, we have experimented with factory-made material systems to structurally mediate the recycling of waste. So because it requires a city of multinational factories that prey on cheap labor, we have proposed an ethical loop where factories must invest in emergency housing. Here we are inside Mechalux, in a Spanish maquiladora that produces lightweight metal shelving systems for global export, negotiating with them to adapt its prefabricated systems into structural scaffolds as armatures for support and informed housing. We design a catalog with the factory's engineers to test a variety of prototypes and configurations. This first Mechalux typology is shown here with adapted recycled urban waste from San Diego, illustrating how top-down institutional resources can support the bottom-up creative intelligence of informal urbanization. A couple of years ago, we built the first example. Uh, being inside the factory, redirecting its profits, its surplus value to sites of emergency uh, was an important milestone in our research-based practice. It was important to introduce you to, uh, briefly to these contextual processes, everyone, because our two community stations in Tijuana operate within this rich ecology of social, environmental, economic, and material relationships and partnerships. So the UCSD Alacran community station is located in the most rugged, precarious, and polluted salt basin in the canyon. It is a partnership with Embajadores de Jesus, a religious organization led by activist pastor economist Gustavo Banda and pastor psychologist Zaida Guillen. With limited resources, they began construction of a refugee camp to provide shelter, food, and basic services to hundreds of Haitian and Central American refugees. And with the help of skilled migrant migrants, they began building their own emergency housing. So we have established a long-term partnership with them to co-develop a community station here to increase refugee housing capacity. We are accelerating production of Mechalux frames to install them on vernacular systems into housing, into a housing infrastructure. The housing scaffolds uh, will be built first, leaving the interiors as planned open systems equipped with utilities to support incremental live work configuration. These envelopes are the seeds for an evolving sanctuary neighborhood to be infilled through time uh, by the migrant residents themselves. We see migrant housing as a mechanism for generating jobs. 
So to sustain the construction process over time, we designed what is called the sanctuary economy. We embed refugee housing in pieces of fabrication, training, and small scale economic development. So with the support of the foundation, we have assembled a community owned business, the Little Haiti Construction Company, uh, with a two library, wood and metal machines, and a couple of trucks and tractors will complete construction of this site and remain operational for future construction jobs across the canyon. The UCSD Alacran Community Station began construction last summer with, uh, with seed capital provided uh, by the New York-based philanthropist uh, Robert Rubin and Stefan Samuel, whose collaboration on this project expands their commitment to the prefabricated social housing logics of post-war French architect Jean Prouvé. And finally, uh, our UCSD communi uh, Divina Community Station. This station is a partnership with Colonos de la Divina Providencia, a, a Tijuana nonprofit that is rooted in the community of Divina. The nonprofit facilitates a variety of social services, including meals for youth, senior services, medical assistance, and environmental awareness. Using the factory Mechalux parts, the station takes the shape of a flexible scaffold to accommodate a variety of informal programs, including mark, uh, informal markets, cultural events, and a series of multi-level spaces to accommodate a small high school, all curated between UC partners. At the Divina Station, we work with leaders, students, and researchers on social protection from landslides, floods, and estuary health beyond the wall. We lead educational programming through which young people understand zones of vulnerability in their own neighborhoods, emphasizing ecological conservation of species and habitat restoration. It's never too early to begin. We have committed here to elevating children as the cross-border citizens of the future. Our two Tijuana-based stations have also advanced important building blocks for our practice, two in particular. First, for us, the informal, is not just an aesthetic category. For us, the informant is a praxis, a dynamic set of functional urban operations from below that counter and transgress the imposition of top-down political power and exclusionary economic models. So hospitality, we know, is the first gesture when the immigrant arrives, an essential charitable opening, a first step in creating a more welcoming society. But as needs become more complex over time, charity is not the appropriate model for building an inclusive society. We need to move from hospitality to inclusion. Thinking beyond shelter is a foundation for rethinking refugee camps everywhere, from places of short-term habitation and service to durable infrastructures for inclusion. Migrant shelters can be agile for negotiating both transition and rootedness the ephemeral and the permanent. So these are the four UCSD community stations. There's so much to say about them, our amazing partners and what we do together in these spaces. While all the stations focus on different issues that reflect the priorities of each community, all richly curated dialogue, collaboration, urban pedagogy, participatory design build and cultural production. And they all aspire to increase public knowledge, change divisive political narratives, foster solidarity and collective agency, and advance strategies to counter exploitation, dispossession, deportation, and environmental calamity. Now, these activities often invite encounters with formal institutions of power that govern the border zone. Sometimes these meetings facilitate mutual recognition and creation, and sometimes they definitely don't. For us, the goal is less about resolving conflict than about understanding, recognizing, and democratizing it. We see democracy in the border zone as a fundamentally bottom-up process of exposing and rendering more accessible the complex histories and mechanisms of injustice that are too often hidden you know, within official accounts of who we are here. We're a region of flows and circulations, shared practices and aspirations, alliances of hearts and minds, regardless of the wall that you know, restricts the movement of our bodies. 
In this sense, the community stations become a cross-border observatory, a platform for constructing what we think of as a more elastic civic identity, you know, from the bottom up, a sort of cross-border race publica. With our partners, we curate what we call unwalling experiments that dissolve the wall using visual tools like diagrams and radical cartographies that situate border neighborhoods within broader spatial ecologies of circulation and interdependence from local to regional to continental and ultimately to global scales. We see elasticity as, as a civic skill, the ability to stretch and return between more expansive ways of thinking over and again to really understand one's own challenges within broader dynamics and processes and to envision opportunities for solidarity beyond walls. Here at the border, the idea of a bio region, the binational watershed system that Teddy introduced you to has been a powerful imaginary for activating more elastic civic thinking. Several years ago, we curated a cross border public action through one of the sewage drains that Homeland Security had carved into the wall between Laurelis Canyon and the estuary that Teddy introduced to you earlier. We negotiated a permit with Homeland Security to transform this drain into an official port of entry southbound for 24 hours. They agreed. They were disarmed by our self-description as just artists, as long as Mexican immigration was waiting on the other side to stamp our passports. Our convoy was comprised of 300 local activists, residents, students, representatives from the two municipalities, and artists, artists and border activists from across the world. Our convoy, you know, we, you know, what we did is really we summoned agencies that are typically at odds with one another, and we moved together southbound under the border wall. And as we did, we witnessed slum wastewater flowing northbound toward the estuary beneath our feet. This strange crossing from estuary to slum through a militarized culvert and the stamping of passports on the other side really you know, illuminated the profound contradictions of this border region. The insight here was that to protect the US estuary, it demands shared investment in the Mexican slum. So in this cultural experiment, we went down. Sometimes nurturing civic elasticity requires sending above the familiar. So imagine a Mexican child standing on a narrow sliver of land hundreds of feet above the border wall, right here at a place called Mirador. Imagine she plants her feet facing west with the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean in front of her, Mexico to her left, the US to her right. Below to her immediate left, she sees the informal settlement where she lives. She can spot her house, her school, and experience their proximity to a country that she and her family are not permitted to enter. Below to her immediate right, almost beneath her feet, she sees the border wall, which from this vantage looks like a flimsy and ridiculous strip inserted into a vast and powerful natural system. Lifting her eyes, she sees the Tijuana River estuary with its vulnerable wetland habitats and the sediment basins that are contrived to catch the northbound flows of waste from her community. And further beyond still, you can't see it in this image, San Diego with all of its wealth, the downtown raising, rising quickly into the sky. From this vantage, all of the characters of this contested zone come to life. And we've witnessed this moment of recognition again and again over the years among children, our students, policymakers, university presidents. There are few places on earth where the collision of informality, military power, environmental vulnerability, and the proximity of wealth and power can be, wealth and poverty, both power and wealth and poverty can be so vividly experienced. But really, you know, the conflicts that we experience here locally between nation and nature are reproduced again and again along the entire trajectory of the continental border between the United States and Mexico. Over the years, we've collected aerial photos like these that document precise moments when the jurisdictional line collides with natural systems, integrating powerfully what dumb sovereignty looks like when it hits the ground in a complex bioregion. Now, our Mexus project 
stretches our elastic civic aspirations to the continental scale. Mexis visualizes the entire border zone without the line. It dissolves the border into a bioregion whose shape is defined by the eight binational watershed systems that are bisected by the international border. Mexis also exposes other systems and flows across this bioregional territory, tribal nations, protected lands, crop lands, urban crossings, many informal ones, and 15 million people who live here and, and more. Ultimately, Mexus challenges America's wall building fantasies with more expansive imaginaries of belonging and cooperation beyond the nation state. Here it is in 2018 at the Venice Architecture Valley. In community stations coming, Mexus really becomes a provocation for dialogue about a bioregional civic identity among Mexicans, Americans, and the diverse tribal nations that inhabit this contested space. Now, the final civic stretch, literally, in the end of our presentation, is a visualization project called the Political Equator, which traces an imaginary line from San Diego, Tijuana, across the planet forming a corridor of global conflict between the 30th and 38th parallels north. And along this trajectory lie some of the world's most contested and violent thresholds. The US-Mexico border at San Diego, Tijuana, the most trafficked international border checkpoint in the Western Hemisphere. The Strait of Gibraltar and the Mediterranean, basically the main route from North Africa into Fortress Europe. The Israeli-Palestinian border that divides the Middle East at Kashmir, a site of intense and enduring territorial conflict between Pakistan and India, and the border between and South Korea, representing decades of intractable Cold War conflict. Now, visualizing this political equator in red alongside the climatic equator below in green was an astonishing discovery to us because the ribbon in between them, give or take a few degrees, our planet's most populous slums, its sites of greatest natural resource extraction and export, and its zones of greatest political instability, climate vulnerability, and human displacement. And when these parallel equators, right, are applied to the Pierce Quincuncial projection from above, the Arctic becomes protagonist with melting ice detonating hemispheric conflict through sea level rise, dramatic coastal vulnerability, and human displacement. Ultimately, in the end, the collision of nationalism, climate catastrophe, and forced migration is the global injustice trifecta of our time. But as we said at the beginning, these dynamics always hit the ground somewhere and are experienced by people locally in everyday places like ours. Thank you. Like ours and like yours. Um, and we, I know we, we packed a lot, but we wanted There's just to there. give you a sense of a cross section across the scales and initiatives. Uh, as our practice really, we've sort of advanced as a curatorial and a practice that mediates some, much of these, uh, you know, dynamics from top down and bottom up and so on. So I don't know, we have time for a question or two. We totally do. I just want to say that that was a fantastic uh, uh, tour through a lot of your work. One of my students texted me in the chat. Um, it's wonderful to see work that breaks the silent complicity of architecture. Oh, that's beautiful. And I just thought you should have that gift too. That was from uh, Ronald Castro Pizzarelli. Pizarro, sorry. Um, are there questions that students would like to raise their hand and ask directly or put in the chat if they prefer? I have a question. Sure, Abby. Um, thank you so much for sharing. It's very inspiring. I posted the question in the chat too because it's a little long-winded. So if you want to read along with it. <laughs> um, but I was thinking about this to, literally today, how even when a developer or an architect's goal is to dignify a given community, fancy spaces end up pushing many original inhabitants out of their neighborhoods. So in your experience, what have you learned about how to design 
beautiful spaces that citizens can enjoy rather than perpetuating gentrification. Kenny, you should take that. Well, you know, just to be certain here that we are not obviously trying to polarize beauty or aesthetics. I mean, obviously we're architects, we care about beauty, mm -hmm. we care about aesthetics, but really we believe that marginalized communities that I mean that, that really is about human dignity uh, and to have access to that. So as a, as a um, community activist partner of ours in one of the community stations told us one day, it's not that we deserve, I mean, we deserve beautiful, you know, neighborhoods, uh, but what happens with gentrification is that they are not making us participants of the economic mm -hmm. development of the profits. We want to remain here. The problem is when beauty becomes a tool for exclusion. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that we need those thoughts because uh, we need to improve the aesthetic uh, quality of our neighborhoods, but in the process we cannot displace uh, those residents. Right. We need to make them collaborators and in fact partners in the development of their own neighborhoods. That's, that's the difference. And, and just to say one thing, we've learned so much about this and Maria Bealta knows the, the, you know, the model of Medellin Colombia. I mean, the idea that, you know, the, the, the emerging dignity and civic identity aligned with, you know, the, the arrival of beautiful structures in neighborhoods that had been neglected for decades. So there's a, there's a huge connection between the, the rebuilding of urban dignity and agency and the experience of investment in one's, in one's community. It's transformative, right? And that's a re oh, sorry, Fona. No, 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 it's okay. Go no, I was ahead. just going to say that's the reason we have also grown a bit uh, dissatisfied with conventional and generic advocacy planning policies. Uh, as uh, plan uh, developers and planning departments come to communities to sell particular projects, pro developer-driven projects that sell aesthetics or in, in a way the packaging of identity uh, 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 as a way of producing a kind of facadism, right? That uh, convinces the community to legitimize a project without knowing that they will be later be displaced. In other words, a lot of our focus is on the style uh, of, you know, in what, in what style should we be building these buildings? But we never talk about the socioeconomic registers, the histories of marginalization and oppression that have uh, uh, maintained these neighborhoods that are depressed, hugely marginalized from the logics of, you know, urban development. So that's what I'm trying to say that uh, our community stations in a way was a, was a method by which we are trying to inject tools for increasing community capacities for political action, uh, recognizing those histories as devices to rethink uh, environment. Obviously aesthetics are part of the issue, uh, meaning we, we, are, we care about aesthetics, but it's not the beginning of the conversation. That's what I'm trying to say. We, mm -hmm. we have to put in, 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 we have to spend style as being the organizing more for a, a community development. Instead, we should talk about those histories and come up with different uh, approaches and processes supported by a progressive government, in a way, to enable communities to develop their own neighborhoods. So good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Hi, I'm gonna jump in for a second. And I just wanted to say thank you very much, uh, Teddy and Fona. And it's so incredible to meet you, even on the screen. I hope to meet you out there at West soon. So thank you for being here. And uh, I, I think you know that I'm a profound admirer of your work. It's very, very inspiring. And um, uh, to learn a little bit more closely today has been wonderful. And this idea that you talk about this region, not the line, but the region, um, and some of the studies that we've been thinking about over here and in Colombia also, is really trying to, to rethink, uh, reimagine the city as a region rather than as a construct that is, uh, that is a closed polygon. Um, and so I think it, it translate, translates to me anyway. And uh, anyway, just, I don't wanna take up the floor, but thank you, wonderful to, to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And obviously, you know, we're, we're dealing with a, a hard line of an international border, but borders are reproduced everywhere in our cities and our practices and our minds. And so we're, you know, we're dealing with 
borders and divisions and obstacles um, and edges and so forth that radiate from this line. And we see them in cities and neighborhoods everywhere. So we think our the work that we're doing is, is really relevant beyond the border region. In the context of what Maria Belalta mentioned uh, in, the, in terms of Colombia or the reference to Colombia is that obviously a lot of these processes have emerged from our long-term research over, over the years. And at times, you know, we have looked at other environments, other cities, other forms of governance that have produced incredible possibilities, uh, different approaches to an urbanization driven by social justice. So we went to Medellin, Colombia, to research how this city had reinvented itself from mm -hmm. being one of the most violent places in the world in the mid 90s to an exemplary model of urbanization of social justice. And while the architectural world was just talking about the buildings, nobody was talking about the institutional transformations that had to take place mm -hmm. in order to advance those, uh, uh, those mm -hmm. possibilities. And one of them was to reinvent public space as a site of knowledge construction. The library parks of Medellin became the instrumental inspiration for us to really advance this project at the border. And we ended up collaborating with Sergio Fajardo, the former mayor, with the former director of planning, Alejandro Echeverri. We began to really deepen ourselves into those processes. So I'm saying this because part of our research is really believing the idea that designers, architects can become interlocutors of institutional memory. Obviously, Medellin is now a different place, potentially, again, back to maybe levels of instability and all of that. But we need to recuperate those best practices because truly they're embedded in that model. There is a DNA that can be reproduced with different actors and institutions across the world. We thought we are going to bring it to the border and rethink our own uh, agenda. So, and by yes. the way, and by the way, it's, you know, Medellin won all sorts of global awards that are articulated through a kind of neoliberal key. That it was a classic story of, of economic investment that opened markets and created opportunity. And we just are really pushing against that kind of a narrative, which aligns itself very smoothly with gentrification narratives in other places. Okay. We really see this as a very bottom up kind of alternative urbanization um, that was actually fighting the kind of um, in encroachment that, that, that neoliberal development models have, have, have produced. So. And by the way, we're looking out for your book. <laughs> I, know, <laughs> I know it's coming soon. Yes, but... <laughs> we're finally, finally assembling it, so yes. Wonderful. Maybe, maybe yeah. when it is published, we can come and visit you. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I just want to say how astoundingly educational this has been for me. It's a new part of the world for me. And I am so impressed with what you're doing, but also the succinctness with which you speak about it brings me in so quickly. Uh, it, you gave me so many reference points. And then I want to say how well that extends to your graphics. You have drawn versions of the world that I haven't imagined. I think that the, the, the forward nature of your thinking is tied to these graphics. And, you know, I have a million questions. I'll buy the book, believe me. <laughs> um, what uh, Mexis is, a, is such an idea for me um, that, that solves something as I've often thought about that border wall on Google Earth, right? Um, what is your, what is your um, uh, fondest wish for that place? You mean in terms of Mexus or the entire? Yeah, well, I would say Mexus because I, what was once a line is now a... a, a... Yes, in, in reality, obviously, uh, you know, part of the agenda here is our work is very local. And uh, as Fona explained, we're interested also in this notion of elasticity to connect local and global and, and enable that to be a, a different way of entering into community dialogue uh, So uh, and so on. Uh, so in terms of Mexus, and thank you, Richard, for uh, noticing obviously the, the relationship between the discourse and the, and the cartographic sort of the construction of images as political tools uh, to rally a, a different type of debate and dialogue. And so in a way, Mexus uh, became a provocation, but now it has become a, our research, one of our research hubs that we are also uh, uh, in, uh, sharing with our students to begin advancing research. So the, the type of research we've done locally, now we, we are advancing it across different hotspots. 
across the entire continental uh, US-Mexico border. So often these uh, community-based initiatives that integrates our students in our design lab, which is embedded in the university, become also a way of advancing research agendas. Mexus is one of them, the political equator is another. Wonderful. You draw it as if it's common sense, which is so wonderful <laughs> for an idea that is, it feels like such a great invention. Oh, thank you, Richard. Actually, you know, this is exactly common sense has somehow died. We need to recuperate it uh, because at the end of the day, it's about accessible, how to produce visual cognitive systems that enable communities to have the complexity of urbanization that has been an inspiration for us. And, you know, as university researchers, we're expected to communicate in very narrow circles to fellow academics who, right, and we've, we've really been trying to pushing against this sort of, um, this rigid separation of research, teaching, and, and, and service. We don't see what we're doing as service. We see ourselves when we're communicating publicly as advancing public research. And in that sense, we're really pushing hard against university research culture and university merit culture, the way merit is distributed on the campuses. In the social sciences where I live, this is not seen as research, right? When you're communicating broadly in common sense ways, it's seen as a kind of service activity. So we're really trying to change that culture. You're really building that case and I thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, thank you there as well. A number of our students need to get to their next class. I need to get to reviews in one of those classes. Thank you so much for spending the time to so beautifully organize and yes, share thank you. the work you're doing. Everybody, if you take your microphones off, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. That's sweet. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Say, say thank you to students who you initially. Quoted. I will. Uh, we, we, love that. Uh, we very much love that. Thank you. Sure. And we will send you the recording, and I imagine Vic will even send you her written text. Fantastic. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Gracias.